Hi everyone, thank you for joining us for another episode of STEM Girls Virtual. My name is Emily and I'm here on behalf of the Cincinnati Museum Center. On this show we talk about different careers in the STEM fields, those fields being science, technology, engineering, and math. Today we have Jinjin Jin Yang with us who's an actuary. Jinjin, Jin, thank you for joining us. Thanks Emily, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, so my first question for you is, what is an actuary? Um, so that is kind of a complicated question since uh, not many people know what we actually do. Um, but basically we are professionals that measure and analyze risk. Um, so that combines math, statistics, and business management into what we do every day. Um, and typically we work in insurance companies, um, but there are also actuaries that work in, in banking, um, investments, government, energy, e-commerce, um, consulting, risk management. Um, the possibilities are pretty much limitless when uh, you become an actuary because there's risk in almost everything we do every day. So Jin Jin, you studied a lot of different things in college to become an actuary. Could you talk a little bit about the math courses in particular that you took while you were at OSU and maybe in high school as well? Yeah, um, absolutely. So uh, like I had mentioned previously, um, I kind of uh, was interested in math pretty early on. So I did want to take those um, those AP courses um, towards the end of my high school career um, in statistics and calculus. And um, it was actually my um, AP teacher that got me into um, being an actuary and kind of maybe figuring out what that meant. Um, so I definitely think it starts there um, is being a good teacher and your teacher really should inform you of all the possibilities um, in STEM fields. Uh, so in addition to kind of um, preparing to do more uh, math and science um, type uh, classes in high school um, to go into college, um, it can be really intimidating to be in a lot of these math and science courses, um, not just um, being a female, maybe in a more male dominated class, but just the material, the difficulty of the material itself. Um, and I would say like, if you think you might want to be an actuary, don't be scared if you're not excelling at these math courses or something because you know real life is a lot different from college unfortunately even though college um, does its best to try and prepare us for what comes after um, but like in my uh, freshman year I remember taking a calculus class and it was just so difficult and I still think um, at the very end of my college um, college career it was still the worst grade I had ever gotten and you know um, if I had let myself be discouraged that I, I suck at this part of calculus. If I let myself say then, um, then that, then, then being an actuary isn't for me, then I wouldn't be here today. And you know, um, again, it's, it's way more about the effort you put in and how hard you work um, than how, how good you are at, at something or at a certain class. And I felt like that in actually a surprising number of my math and stats courses, that things, things weren't quite clicking um, or, you know, I would have to try harder than other people to understand things. Um, but as an actuary, the great thing is sometimes it's all about the math. And then sometimes it's more about the creative solutions and the way that you present your data. Um, so, yeah, I would say just don't be don't be discouraged about maybe certain classes or don't get hung up on the small stuff. Um, but more just try your best. And if you like that, then that is something that you should pursue. Oh, that's awesome. And I think for college in particular, grad school for some, not every class should be easy because work's not always going to be easy. Um, so having those challenges while you're still in a structure of school is very good because you are getting some of that experience. There's professors and grad assistants that are there that could help as well to prepare you. So that's great. And um, could you also speak to maybe like a daily work day for an actuary or kind of like what what is an actuary doing during during their work time? 
Yeah, um, so as I had uh, mentioned before, um, I work in personal lines insurance um, at my company um, under pricing. Um, and so for kind of your uh, insurance company actuary, um, there are kind of two main, two main types of actuaries and that would be pricing and reserving. Um, so pricing kind of deals with looking forwards um so that would be um thinking about how often risks are going to happen um how at risk um a certain uh exposure is going to be um and figuring out how much is that sh how much should that cost um what should your um they call it an insurance premium be how much should we charge you uh for the risk that the company is going to take on on your behalf um, so that is kind of what pricing actuaries do, um, and it's kind of what I do day to day. Maybe not um, that that big of a question. Um, sometimes it's just one state, um, one particular kind of insurance um, is kind of what I would do day to day. And I get to use um, my computer. I get to um, use different um, softwares and different tools to kind of um, help me along. So yes, that's another note. You don't have to be great at multiplying or, um, you know, writing out numbers or like solving for X. You don't have to be awesome at that um, anymore in the field because guess what? Your computer does a lot of that for you. <laughs> um, uh, but also um, on the reserving side, that's kind of um, looking at the history and seeing where uh, what the history is telling you. Um, so what reserving actuaries would do is to make sure the company holds enough money to cover all of its liabilities. Um, so again, pricing actuaries, um, they, they price insurance and how much it should cost. Um, reserving actuaries make sure we actually keep enough money on hand to cover all of the obligations that we have. Um, so a great example is um, uh, for an, an accident happens, let's say a car accident. Um, so what a reserving actuary might look at is, hey, how much is this accident going to cost, um, is going to cost ultimately? Um, so, you know, maybe it was just reported. Well, how much do you, do we think this is going to, at the very end, when it's all said and done, how much is it going to cost? You know, maybe the car is going to need more, more repairs than we first expected. You know, maybe um, the claim has to go to court. Um, you know, there could be all kinds of costs, medical costs, um, people can sue. Um, so, you know, what is that going to cost in the end and how much money are we going to need to hold on hand to make sure that we can cover all of our obligations? Okay, and would um, those two different types of actuaries in a company work together sometimes? Or yeah, we, um, we do a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there is, there's also a lot of room for collaboration um, in the actuarial field. Um, so typically uh, pricing actuaries might be um, more, more outward facing. Um, they might talk with uh, product managers, different parts of the business, they might be giving um, presentations, um, but and also re uh, working with reserving actuaries because a lot of the time um, their responsibilities do kind of overlap. Um, but there also is room in the actuarial field um, if you like to kind of work more by yourself, if you like to have self-contained projects. Um, so there's room for both kinds of people there. Um, but I would say that uh, communication and being able to communicate your findings to maybe someone who doesn't work with the numbers very often is also getting more and more important in the field. Yes, and I think no matter what, where you work, what you do, it could be your first job in high school. Communicating and communicating well is so important. So hearing you say like that specifically is you're communicating with people who like me might not understand numbers very well, um, but your graphs laid it out beautifully. So thank you, but awesome. Okay. Um, and I did also want to talk about kind of maybe um, the interesting things happening um, that actuaries get involved in in insurance um, that might not be commonly known um, because, you know, our, our field can be really, um, really trailbla trailblazing, really um, interesting and on the forefront of new technologies. Um, and like one of those things is uh, what are we going to do about automated cars when they come out? You know, how are we going to assess the risk involved 
um, with a computer program, driving a car, what happens when it glitches? Who's responsible for those crashes? Right. You know, is it, the, is it the computer developer? Is it the driver that wasn't paying attention to their program? Um, there's so many questions out there of, um, you know, what is technology and insurance going to look like in the future? And um, something that's, that's still new right now and that we're working on, um, for example, in, uh, in auto insurance is um, called telematics. And this is something that I think everyone has actually heard of, um, whether they know it or not. Um, but it's like those commercials that you see um, where like uh, they have those devices that you can, you can um, buy for your car or you just download the app and then you get your insurance costs based on how you drive. Um, okay, yeah. And yeah, so yeah, the term for that is actually telematics. Um, and so that's, we're still trying to figure that out. You know, how are we going to collect that kind of data? Um, you know, how, how do we go from an app being downloaded on your phone to using that to figure out how risky of a driver you are? Um, and that would be like kind of converting those factors into, into numbers that equal dollar amounts. Um, so it's like, you know, if you brake too hard, what does that cost? You know, how, mm -hmm. how um, much does that increase the risk of you getting into a car crash? Or if you drive too fast, what if you um, drive over the speed limit uh, often? Like, you know, how much risk is that going to add? Um, and this is kind of a new field and it kind of creates all of these possibilities of new data and how to interpret the data. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to kind of existing fields and existing fields are things like like your age, you know, younger people kind of drive faster a lot of the time. That's why if you're younger, um, if you're like, if you just got your license, well, you're probably more likely to get in an accident. So you're going to be more ex expensive to insure. Mm -hmm. um, so those things are kind of commonplace already, but there's so much technology out there um, that can make insurance interesting and, and complicated and um, new and exciting right well my mom says i'm a good driver so <laughs> no um no that's awesome and yes people who are applying for insurance and taking a, a quiz like that i don't want to doubt humankind but a lot of us don't want to admit if we are not maybe the best at driving <laughs> so that that i could see where that would really complicate things because if someone is saying well of course i go the speed limit everywhere i go <laughs> Really. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And so, yeah, it's also um, a kind of uh, self-reported versus actual kind of problem in insurance, too, um, because like one of the most common things that people do is is they say they drive less per year than they actually do. Um, so something like telematics would be able to verify how many miles you actually drive your car, because, you know, the more you drive on the roads, the more likely you are to have an accident. Um, so there, there's just so many new ways to verify that, um, not only in auto insurance, but, you know, also in home insurance and life insurance and health insurance. There's just so many new technologies out there um, mm -hmm. to, again, not just assess risk, um, but, but to prevent risk and to um, reduce the costs of risk. Right. Wow. Oh, no, that is really cool to, to kind of peer into the future and see what life could be like even just like five years from now. Yeah, absolutely. It's really awesome. I think it's really great that there's so much variety in the different types of job an actuary could do. So you say actuaries calculate risk. Can you speak about like how risks are being evaluated? How do you calculate risks? What, what, what is involved in that part of your job? Um, so there are different risks that different types of actuaries look at, um, which we can also talk about the different kinds of actuaries there are. Um, but it has gotten more and more complicated as, uh, you know, technology um, has evolved. Um, but for example, uh, a common risk that everyone faces every day is um, involved in like homeowners insurance. So what uh, happens to your house when, for example, a tornado comes through? Um, so an actuary's job would kind of be to assess 
maybe how often um, a tornado would be expected to hit in a certain area. And um, if it does hit, uh, how much damage is that going to cause? How much is that going to cost? And are there ways to mitigate that risk, um, to kind of reduce the risk, or if it does happen, to reduce the losses that are possible from that risk? Um, and there can also be a lot of creativity in kind of determining um, all of those things that go into risk. Sure. And yes, I'd love to learn about different types of actuaries, but also you mentioned creativity. And that's something a lot of people that I interview bring up is working in STEM means also being creative. It's not, you're not strictly a scientist or a mathematician. You're needing to be creative to solve problems or come up with solutions in your job. So it's really neat that you specifically called out being creative because that is something that I think when kids especially hear STEM, they think, I can't enjoy art if I want to be a scientist. And it's like, no, being an artist and a scientist together probably balance each other, assist you in both of those. So that's really neat. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I feel like that's, um, that is definitely an important thing to call out, um, that being an actuary or um, doing math, it doesn't have to be boring. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, everyone does boring things every day, of course, you know, we have to get by. Um, but there is a lot of creativity in um, discovering new problems and solving new problems that don't have um, black and white answers. And that is part of uh, what we do every day, too. Yeah. yeah, and could you explain a little bit more about different types of actuaries? Yeah, sure. So there are two main governing bodies kind of um, of actuaries because to be um, an actuary, you do need to get your credentials. Um, so technically, um, I'm not a full-fledged actuary. Um, my current title is an actuarial analyst. Um, and so I work in personal lines insurance. So uh, the uh, governing body for my credentials is the CAS um, or the Casual Act Casualty Actuarial Society. Um, and so this little graphic just kind of shows um, the exam process to get your credentials. Um, so in school, you typically want to take a couple of actuarial exams, um, exam one and two, which are probability and financial mathematics are a good place to start. Um, and you can also gain uh, your VEEs um, in school, which is kind of getting credit for uh, classes that pertain to risk um, at your university. Um, and so typically you want to kind of get some exam experience before you go out and find a new job. Um, but this, there's a lot of information on this slide, um, but it's just kind of to show you that the, it is kind of a lengthy exam process to get your full credentials. Um, you have to go through uh, seven exams to get your um, ACAS, uh, which is your associate of the um, Casualty Actuarial Society, and then three more exams to get your FCAS, which is your fellowship. Um, so this is specifically pertaining to, um, like I said, um, property and casualty insurance typically. Uh, so these would be actuaries that work in uh, car insurance, home insurance, um, sometimes specialized lines. Uh, this is maybe where you would get into things like uh, ensuring really large companies, um, risks that are very unusual as well. Okay, and um, typically is there a set number of years to, to complete these steps or is it more just your own, setting your own pace to complete these steps? Right, um, which is also another great question um, because it can be very intimidating knowing that you have to complete all of these exams. Um, and I think the industry in general, um, it's getting more competitive. So the more exams you typically have um, under your belt, the better. But I also feel like it's important um, to have a company culture that is going to be flexible with how often you take exams. Um, a lot of people need to go at their own pace. They have other things going on in their lives. Um, so, you know, it can be anywhere from like a very fast three years if you're really, you're really going quickly through all of these exams or it can be as long as 10, 20 years. Um, so you see a lot of different types of 
um, of people who have taken different life paths out there um, to become a fully credentialed actuary. Oh, wow. um, and this is, uh, if we go on to the next slide here, um, we can talk about the, uh, the second governing body um, for uh, actuaries the SOA, uh, which is the Society of Actuaries. Um, and there are also two very similar designations um, through the SOA, and that is your um, ASA, your associate, um, or your FSA, your fellowship. Um, and so uh, people, uh, actuaries that get their credentials through the SOA uh, typically work in life and health insurance. Um, so that would be uh, providing the security in case something happens to you um, to make sure that your family is going to be taken care of, um, or health insurance, uh, which would be making sure that you're taken care of um, and that you can get the health care that you need in case something ever happens. Um, and again, it's a very similar pathway, uh, but uh, they do diverge after the first couple of exams um, into more specifically uh, life and health type exams. Um, so again, you have to go through um, introductory type exams that you want to get done before you graduate from college. Um, and then more specialized exams that are specifically um, given by the SOA before you can get um, first your ASA um, and then in the next slide your FSA. Um, and specifically um, in the SOA, you are also able to select um, a specialty track. Um, and this is also kind of shows the different kinds of things that you can do um, with your actuarial um, credentials. So things like retirement benefits, um, group and health insurance, um, more uh, technologically um, inclined fields like quantitative finance and investment, uh, corporate finance, um, you can pick a specialty track before you get your fellowship. And um, that can be really helpful in giving you a lot of background knowledge in whatever field you end up in with um, your actuarial credentials. Wow, and so actuaries actually play a pretty big role in our daily lives. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, which what they is, do, but they're, they're back there. Yeah, they uh, they really do affect that everything you're in. Um, like for for example, um, you know, uh, people who drive who are on the roads, they're required to have um, they're required to have auto insurance. And so, you know, actuaries directly impact how much you're getting charged for that um, and what kind of coverages you're receiving. Um, and so, you know, if there's risk in your life and you want to uh, help kind of accommodate for that risk. Um, then, you know, you're in direct contact with something that an actuary does. Oh, wow. Yeah. So everyone watching, you can walk away with this knowing what an actuary is and everything that they do. So that's awesome. Shall we move on to the next slide? Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. Okay. Um, so I'm going to jump ahead to a couple of questions. Um, so you're a very big proponent of diversity and women in STEM. So can you talk about some of those passions? And I can see on the slide here that you've broken a lot of it down by ethnicity. Um, so can you talk a little bit about um, women of color in STEM? Um, yeah, absolutely. It's um, something I'm passionate about, um, which is, of course, why I am talking to uh, Emily today and talking to all of you guys. Um, and well, first of all, um, lots of graphics, clearly. Um, actuaries love their graphs. <laughs> um, they love their graphs and um, trying to show information to others um, in a different way. Um, so that is just kind of a side note that communication is also really important. Um, and if you think that, um, you know, you might want to talk to more people than, than just typing on your computer every day, um, you can still get that as an actuary. You, um, you can be engaged uh, with talking, um, working with a team and working with other people and um, kind of showing them what you know in uh, a, di a digestible way. Um, so this graphic is uh, specifically from the CAS um, and it shows that, you know, we are working towards diversity, um, but we're also not quite there yet. There yet. So there's a lot of work to be done. Um, on the chart to the right, uh, you're seeing that 
um, the yellow is the percentage of females um, as casualty actuarial society members. Um, and the blue is male. Um, and you see that the field is still predominantly male, even though there are more females joining. Um, and it's something that needs to constantly, constantly be worked on. Um, because we, we want more representation. We want uh, girls and women to feel like they can be, be comfortable in the field, um, to feel like they're represented, uh, to feel like there's people who look like them um, around them. Um, so I think it's really important to, to push for equality there. Mm -hmm. Oh, and totally. And talking about it is one of the major first steps. Um, and even seeing, looking at um, on the right, you see the slight decrease in the number of male uh, CAS members, but it's still, like you're saying, it's 68% in 2020. So, you know, that's, it's still a very large amount of male, male members. So that's, that's a lot. Yeah. yeah. And, um, Jinjin, could you speak about, and this is personal, could you speak about being a woman of color in a STEM field? Um, maybe have, have there been instances of discrimination or anything like that? Um, yeah, great question. Um, and I also, I feel like it's really important to, to talk about your experiences, um, especially if they have been negative because um, things do need to change. Right. Um, but uh, personally, I have actually had very positive experiences, um, specifically in the workplace. Um, there are a lot of companies out there these days um, that realize that um, we do need to get more women interested in STEM fields. And um, that that kind of has to be an active effort on everyone's part. Um, so I've always felt very, very welcome um, to always share my thoughts and my opinions um, and to kind of uh, to, to be at companies that that are actively looking for for more women um, or more people of color um, for more minorities in the field. And um, that is always uh, something to look for if you are looking um, for a job. Um, but also it can be really intimidating to to be the only person that looks like you in a room um, and unfortunately that still happens to me almost every day um, i'm the only female in a meeting um, i'm the only person of color in a meeting um, and it it is it's very intimidating to be in a situation like that and know that other people have had different experiences than you um, but I think the important part is to um, to not be scared of that, um, to be okay with being different, to be okay with sticking out a little bit maybe. Um, and because, you know, you never know who is looking up to you, who wants to be like you, um, what kind of example that you're setting for people or what kind of trail that you're blazing for um, other women who want to do what you want to do. Exactly. And thank you for sharing that. Because again, delving into a little bit of personal um, questions. And you went to the Ohio State University and you were on the board of Women in Math and Science. Can you speak about what WIMS does? Um, um, yeah. And WIMS was, um, was a really, uh, really special to me um, during my college experience. Um, and it was because we tried to kind of provide that community um, and not just the community, uh, but to do the outreach into um, outside of the Ohio State community as well. Um, so WIMS was there to, um, to network with other uh, women in STEM fields to kind of discuss these inequalities and how we can go about um, kind of equalizing the field out there um, and to provide mentors, whether they be student mentors um, that might be a year or two ahead of you in college, um, but also like faculty members um, as mentors or mentors of people out in the industry as well. Um, so there so there were those direct connections um, within the uh, university. Uh, but also we 
we had an annual event for Girl Scouts um, that was uh, that was like a be a detective for a day. So we set up a lot of science related and math related events um, to really get Girl Scouts interested in doing these things and solving these problems. And that is um, also directly pertinent um, to what actuaries do, which is just solving problems every day. Um, so we love to get women um, and young girls kind of excited to solve problems to use science and math um, and to not be scared of doing so. Right, and as a former Girl Scout, I would have loved that. Um, I love a good mystery and also, this ties back to your previous response to the question of seeing others or having a, a peer group or a support group or like, again, Girl Scouts who are partaking in this event are probably looking up to the cool college students they are getting to interact with. So, you know, it's, it's starting young and building it up. Um, so that's really awesome that um, that group does that work. And I think with a lot of um, just any career you have, uh, any kind of networking you can do, any way you could meet maybe former alumni from your college who maybe have a career in the field that you want to have a career in, things like that, being in clubs if you're able to, that's a really great way to just kind of figure out even more so what you want to do, get internships, things like that. So that sounds like a really awesome club. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and then um, going back a little bit, so you did go to the Ohio State University. Can you tell us what you studied to become an actuary? Um, yeah, I did uh, attend the Ohio State University, uh, go Bucks. Um, and I did, I was able to major in actuarial science. Um, and you know, that's not a, a commonplace thing quite yet. Um, not every university is going to offer an actuarial science degree. Um, there are plenty of resources out there that we can share um, at the end uh, where you can find universities that might be more geared um, towards preparing you to be an actuary. Um, but uh, my coursework uh, would include um, lots of math classes, statistic classes, um, but also classes specifically pertaining to insurance and business. Um, so it's nice to have kind of a well-rounded background um, to be really good at the computations, but also um, be able to show them in a graph form and also be able to communicate those results. Um, and you know, if you're looking at a university um, or a school that doesn't offer an actuarial science degree, um, it could be a good idea to look into data science, um, to maybe uh, become yeah, a data scientist, um, to look at just a math degree um, or kind of a business degree as well um, can get you started in the field. Um, and yeah, before, uh, going to Ohio State um, in high school. Um, I would also uh, take kind of a couple of extra math courses here and there. Um, also take AP courses um, to kind of get a taste for um, statistics and kind of how to display statistics. Awesome. And so it sounds like you've always been really drawn to math. Um, what, what about math drew you to it? Um, so I think it was the satisfaction of solving a problem. Um, and at first I was always drawn to, um, to the clear cut problems, to you know, um, being presented with an equation and there's one answer. Um, and unfortunately in real life and in being an actuary, that is not necessarily the case. Um, but it does provide a good introduction of creative ways of different ways to solve problems um, and to really um, find um, fulfillment in solving problems. Um, so I feel like I was drawn to math, um, not only because it felt good to solve problems, it was also, it felt good to, um, to be good at something, I guess. Um, so I always liked it because, um, because of those answers, um, because it was about you and um, proving yourself. Um, and that is also really important when you become an actuary is that um, all of your, your hard work pays off. Um, is kind of the advancement in the field is based on how, how you pass your exams, how hard you work. Um, so I, I guess that's also 
speaks to um, a different kind of equality is like once you're already in the field, you know, maybe if you still aren't uh, well represented as a female, um, you will advance based on your merit, um, which is, is, is a great thing to be in. Yes, definitely. And we don't talk about the M and STEM a lot on this show. You're actually one of the first people I've interviewed that's had a very strong math background. Um, for a lot of kids, math is intimidating. Um, I know I definitely struggled with it. Do you have any advice for kids who might be struggling in math who are watching right now? Um, absolutely, and that is um, as as cliche as it is, as you know, as many people have said to you over and over, is to not give up on it. Um, and just because you know you might not think you're good at something doesn't mean you actually aren't. Um, and uh, um, I guess what I'm trying to say there is that your attitude and your work ethic are going to take you a lot further um, in your math classes, um, in your life, in your career than just being good at something. Um, it really depends on how hard you're going to try and um, if you're going to go at it with a good attitude um, and also to just not be afraid to ask for help. Um, and if your teacher isn't going to help you, um, you know, there are other resources out there. Um, and, you know, it's, if you like something, even though if you don't think you're good at it, to definitely just stick with it. I think that's excellent advice. I think a lot of times when we, when we enjoy something, I think we are expected to be good at it. And no, not necessarily. Um, you know, I, I enjoy baking, but I would never be on the Great British Bake Off, <laughs> you know, but it's like I still enjoy it. And I mean, I, I make a mean chocolate chip cookie, but I think, I think the work ethic is really important. And I think, particularly the girls watching this, math is one field where I think we lose our confidence pretty young. So hearing that, you know, there's other resources out there, we'll share some with you that Jen Jen's gonna share with us at the end of this. So I would just say, keep at it and always ask for help, always, whether it's another student who's really good at math, whether it's another teacher, there's someone out there who wants to help you if you're wanting to, to get better at it. Absolutely. Yeah. So Jen Jen, going back to talking about diversity in school and workplaces, do you think local colleges could be doing something to help with getting more diverse students in their majors, workplaces and such? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I don't even think it just starts at college. I really think it starts in our high schools and our elementary schools. Okay. Um, and that is providing role models and mentorship that is going to um, make girls and women feel welcome in the field. Um, and that also goes into um, even women, because um, there are more women in the teaching profession. Um, a lot of women have these unconscious biases, these um, unconscious just stereotypes or the ways of thinking that, um, you know, why would women want to learn more about, about science and math? Wouldn't you rather do something else? Um, and first of all, um, it's good that we need to identify these thoughts um, more often and to also um, actively combat that type of thinking um, and to push back against that kind of stereotype that, um, you know, maybe women should, should always be teachers or caregivers and instead of being scientists and mathematicians and actuaries. Um, and so, you know, if you ever are in school and you feel like someone is treating you different because you're um, a girl in a math class, that's something to, um, to call out, to bring to someone's, someone else's attention. Um, and like in this graphic, um, the second graphic here uh, based on um, coming from the SOA, um, you again see that um, in the right side where it says sex by uh, race and ethnicity, that across all, um, all races and ethnicities, um, females are being underrepresented in the field. And that does start um, in, our, in our schools. 
Um, so I think it's also like uh, when you get to the college level, um, your academic counselors uh, being supportive of if you want to pursue um, more classes in a STEM field um, and making those uh, those opportunities available to you and really uh, being there to assist instead of possibly steer you towards a different field. No, and that's, that's excellent advice. I actually changed academic advisors in college because they were trying to steer me one way versus what I wanted. And you're very empowered to normally, depending on your school, change your academic advisor. Um, so that's that's something too, is if there's a problem and the person you're working with maybe is seeing things differently, there's probably another person there that you can speak to or work with. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I love how colorful this graph is. <laughs> yes, we do love, we do love our charts and our graphs. <laughs> okay. So um, again, talking a little bit about more women in STEM, um, I love this graphic over here on the right where you do see there is an increase in women getting STEM jobs, but we're still underrepresented in a lot of those fields, potentially. Like computer workers went up and now it's sliding back down. Yeah, and um again it it goes towards um it goes back to the idea um of making a conscious effort to combat the sexism and the stereotyping um and it's not only um maybe uh males um who are trying to exclude uh women from the field but it's also other females in the field or female role models um is that the idea um that you don't need to push others down. Um, instead, you can bring everyone up. Um, because uh, I feel like that is a mindset of a lot of um, women in STEM in the past and today is that I, um, you know, maybe I spent so much effort, it took so much for me to, to get to the top and to be where I am. I don't want anyone else joining me. Like, you're going to have to struggle too. Um, but actually what we should be doing is to um, to be better female role models to be better female mentors um, to show um, young girls that it's it's cool to be in stem fields um, that it's it's okay that you're going to be with people um, who look like you um, and you know that really that does start at a young age and like another thing that we can do is to um, talk more about female achievements um, in popular culture, in, um, in mainstream media, um, to talk about female scientists and to talk about um, what females are doing today in STEM fields. And a lot of it is really groundbreaking, um, but sometimes still a lot of those male names are still at the forefront, um, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 And um, another thing that we can do um, when you get to to looking for your first job when you're um, deciding between companies or seeing where um, you think you are going to fit in um, is for companies to um, to make jobs desirable to women too um, because STEM jobs have have so long kind of been um, like a boys club kind of like the culture of um, a culture that's geared more towards males than females um, to be kind of rigid and um, exclusionary. Um, but the idea that, hey, like if you're an actuary, if you want to be an actuary and you have to take all the, these exams, well, you can have time for yourself too. Like, you know, you, you need the flexibility to maybe if you want to get married, have kids. Um, and I feel like that is also a big detractor um, from getting women into the actuarial field is like, I don't want to take exams. I want to have kids. Um, but I think it's important to acknowledge that you can do both. And if the company that you're working for doesn't support that kind of flexibility, well, it's not, it's nothing wrong with you. There's something wrong with the company. Yes. Oh man. Yes. Um, also this is for anyone watching who's maybe applying for an internship, or interviewing for colleges right now, a really important question to ask is what is the culture around this organization or 
when I was looking for grad schools, I asked one of the schools I was looking at, what is the program like once you're in it? Because it was already competitive to get into it. And then they said, well, it's a very competitive program, even once you're in it. Students are really going up against each other on projects. And like, I, I want to have more of a collaborative type of grad school experience, not competing against fellow students. So, you know, I think that's an important question for anyone watching. Um, just to kind of ask if I'm going to intern here over the summer, what's the culture like? What is, what is the breakdown of, uh, you know, how do people spend their time in the office? Is it a very like open, open office space and are we chatting or is it very much like I'll be working by myself and I'll be very quiet? <laughs> you know, those, those kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's definitely important to kind of, you study the, the place where you want to work or study at before your interview, just as well as you'll get prepared for the interview. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And do we have any more? You have uh, just resources, actually. Awesome. And we will, uh, anyone watching, we will share these resources as well in the link to this video. Um, so, Jinjin, you shared some of those resources. For schools that might have more of an actuar actuarial, am I saying it correctly, actuarial study mm -hmm. or, um, type major, obviously OSU has one. So, for those here in Ohio, that's great. But um, off the top of your head, can you think of any others or? Um... Yeah, um, so there is this really cool thing um, that our, uh, our actuarial organizations do. Um, and it's again, back to the whole, we love numbers, we're numbers people. Um, but there are uh, lists of schools and designations um, that they're called like centers of excellence, um, or they will, there's actually a, um, a pretty complete list of um, universities that um, provide training for, for exams um, that have kind of been vetted um, by the organizations to kind of prepare someone to be an actuary. Um, so there are a lot of resources out there um, and not only just, just university programs, but there are summer programs, there's programs for high schoolers out there. Um, and I feel like, I think the, the actuarial um, community as a whole um, is definitely always trying to get more people interested in being an actuary. And um, I feel like if any, um, if you ask any actuary what they do and you're actually interested, um, that person could talk on forever. <laughs> No, that's awesome. And um, you've already given a lot of great advice in this interview, but my very last question for you is um, for any of our young women and girls watching right now who may want a career in a STEM field, what advice would you give to them? Um, so the, the most important thing, um, I think, is always to, to know your worth. Um, that you are um, valuable, you are going to be valuable to a company and to not settle for something less or to not um, call out things that you don't think are appropriate or are correct. Um, to definitely not give up in what, what you're doing. Um, again, you don't have to be number one at everything all the time. It's more about the effort you're putting into it um, than being the best at something. Um, and also to, to not be afraid to be different, to stick out in the field a little bit, um, to, to go into meetings where you're the only female, um, to be in a classroom where there might be two girls and 20 guys. Um, but it's always important to kind of lift each other, each other up and um, to be okay being more of a trailblazer. Because, you know, we are, we are um, going towards gender equality in STEM fields, uh, but unfortunately we're not quite there yet. Um, so, you know, it's going to be great the day that you can walk into um, a math class and it be exactly half men and half women. Um, but until then you have to kind of get comfortable um, being different. And I, I really loved all of that in the beginning to know your worth. I think no matter what you want to do in your life, no matter what your age, to remember that. Um, I always like to tell the grown-ups sometimes, like, listen to this part because this isn't just advice for, for teenagers. Um, so that was really great. So, Jinjin, Jin, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Emily. And thank you, everyone, for watching, and we'll see you next time.